Hello and welcome to Colin's Astronomy Week. My name is Tom and I'm an astronomer and also a Collins author. So I write books all about space, how to see things in the night sky. And this year I had a very exciting opportunity to publish a special book with Collins, something that means a lot to me because it's a book that I would love to have had when I was younger. I've written a book for young, budding space explorers who want to get started understanding the night sky. And it's called You Can Explore the Universe. Now, this book is available everywhere that books are sold, in bookshops or online. And you can buy it as an ebook for your tablet or as a paperback book. I really like the paperback book myself because you can draw and write on the pages and really make the book your own. By the way, You Can Explore the Universe is part of a range of books from Collins, which offer all sorts of different activities to get involved in. Some of these involve going outdoors, others are creative things that you can do inside. My book is just one of 10 available now, and there really is a great range of stuff to get stuck in with. But I'm glad you're here with me to explore the universe with this session. So in You Can Explore the Universe, you'll find dozens of activities, and these are designed to get you out and looking at the sky. There are just so many things to explore up there, whether it's using scientific methods to study the cosmos, or whether it's learning how to take your own photographs, or whether it's spotting special events. This session is all about stargazing, and we're going to look ahead soon at what's visible in the sky this month, October. But first I want to talk a little bit about how to get started stargazing. Now luckily I've been stargazing all over the place in different parts of the world, and especially here where I live, in London. So I feel qualified to tell you that you really can go stargazing absolutely anywhere. But of course, if like me you live in a city, for example London, then you've probably noticed that there aren't very many stars visible, or at least that's the way it seems at first. Because the sky itself seems to be very bright, doesn't it? Often mm, an orange sort of colour. And really, we want the sky to be very dark and filled with stars. Now about half of us around the world live in towns and cities, and it's not always practical to get away from where the lights are. But if you live nearer to the countryside, you might be able to find a better stargazing site that's not too far away from you. You can use a website like Light Pollution Map to find parts of the country which are better for looking at the stars. Perhaps there's a really good dark sky site that you can drive to that's out in the countryside a little way where you're going to be able to see a lot more. But don't worry, you can get started at home. It's just useful to know how to find better places as you go forward with your stargazing in the future. One of the best ways to improve your chances of seeing the night sky wherever you are is to make sure that your eyes stay adjusted to the dark. It turns out that our eyes change, as we're going to see in a moment. When we look into light sources, it's harder to see anything else. So we want to make sure that direct sources of light, things like street lights or security lights, aren't shining in our eyes. Even if you do live in a bright city like London, as long as you don't have lights shining in your eyes, then when you go outside to look at the sky, over time your eyes will adjust and you will still be able to see more stars. You've probably come across this sort of thing before. Have you ever woken up, turned the light on and looked in a mirror? You'll notice that the pupils in your eyes are much larger and then they shrink down again. When it's dark outside, the pupils in our eyes get larger and when it's brighter, they get smaller. This is just one of the ways that we adjust to looking at things when it's dark. There's another way too, which involves the cells in our eyes. And it takes a lot longer, about 30 minutes or so, to become fully adjusted to the darkness. Unfortunately, you can unadjust yourself to the darkness in about three seconds. So it really is important to try and stay adjusted to the dark as best as you can. But of course, you must take care and be safe. And in order to do that and to not bump into things at night, you can use a red torch to find your way. 
This will keep you adjusted to the dark and it will make things easier to see. Now you don't have to buy a red torch, you can actually make your own. If you have a torch, some card and some sweet wrappers, you can make a simple filter for your torch which you can slide on and off, which means that you can use it as a white light torch when you need it or as a red light torch when you're doing stargazing. It's actually a very, very easy thing to do. And if you want a full guide, it's on page 10 of You Can Explore the Universe. This is just one of several things that you can make and do that you can find in my book. And your red light torch will allow you to read things at night and move around safely outside without bumping into anything or coming to harm. So this is a great example of something you can make to improve your stargazing. But what about finding things in the night sky? Well, in order to know where to look, you first need one very important piece of information. You need to know which way you're facing. In other words, you need to know which way your garden is facing, or your balcony, or the windows in your home, wherever you plan to do your stargazing. And you can find this using any maps, like Google Maps, zooming in on your house, and finding out which way each part of your house is facing, finding out where your stargazing site is facing. This is important because when you look in different parts of the sky, like the north and the south, you see different stars. And in a moment, we're going to see all the different directions of the sky for October. You can plot the sky very easily at home on your computer using a free piece of software. It's called Stellarium. Stellarium is absolutely brilliant. You can download it for your computer, whether it's a PC computer or a Mac. You can download it on tablets or smartphones. And you can even use a simple version of Stellarium in your browser on your computer by going to the website stellarium.org. So let's go over to Stellarium and take a look at October's skies and some of the best things to look for in the coming nights. Now, when you open up Stellarium, the first thing you'll see is the sky and the ground. At the moment, the time on Stellarium is set down here to about 20 to 6 in the evening. This is British summertime, which is also UTC plus 1. Remember that summertime ends at the end of October, but that's okay because Stellarium will look at the clock on your computer and it will automatically update itself. If you push your mouse over to the left hand side, you can see lots of different settings here. The one at the top is the location, it looks like a little compass. So when you open this window, you can click on the map or choose from a list of where you are. But if your computer is on the internet, most of the time Stellarium will figure out where you are by looking on the internet. So for example, I'm in Greenwich in London and Stellarium has already figured this out. This is important because if I was anywhere else in the world, I would see different stars and I want to make sure that Stellarium is showing me the sky from where I am. And you'll need to make sure it's showing you the sky from where you are as well. But don't worry, if you're anywhere in the UK, then your skies are going to look quite similar to mine. You'd need to go much farther away for the skies to look substantially different. Now we can click anywhere on the sky with our mouse and just drag the screen around. And you'll notice that there isn't much to see right now because according to Stellarium, it's still sort of daytime or well, it's around sunset. The sky isn't very dark yet. But notice those red letters in front of you. They are the cardinal directions on a compass. Here we have N for North, NW for Northwest. And over here in the West, you can see the sun. And the sun sets in the West, doesn't it? So this must be around sunset after all. Over here in the South, we see what Stellarium shows us when we first open it up. And I think it does that because when we look south in the sky, that's where we see most of the interesting constellations and also the planets and the moon. So let's first go over and watch the sunset by changing the time. You can see the time ticking down here at the bottom. And if you push your mouse down here, you can change the time. You can go to the current time. You can pause and play the time. You can rewind time and you can go forward in time. So I'm going to click on this a couple of times to speed up time. And as I do that, you can see the sun starting to move down there behind the trees. Let's go even faster and see what happens as the sun goes down. And as it does so, I'm going to press play and then I'm going to press the play button again to pause time. Now the time on the clock is around about seven o'clock. 
Stellarium is currently showing me the stars on the 1st of October. But we want to look into the future really, so let's change the date. Up here in the date and time window, I'm going to go to the end of Collins Astronomy Week, which is the 10th of October. So let's tick up the date and see how the sky changes. Now the time is still the same. It's still around about seven o'clock in the evening. And at seven o'clock, this is what the sky will look like. Well, you might see fewer stars than this, of course, if you're in Greenwich, you will. But if you're out in the countryside, you'd see a very beautiful starry sky. Although Stellarium is clogging up the picture here, isn't it? We can see some things have labels on, like these two planets. And we also have these blue things. These are meteor showers. We're going to talk about a really good meteor shower in a moment. But let's take a look and see which planets are visible. Now I'm going to rewind time a little bit, because over there behind the trees I can see a bright planet in the sunset sky, and it's labelled Venus. There's Venus, looking good. Pressing spacebar after clicking on anything in Stellarium will put it right in the middle of your screen. And then if you roll your mouse wheel forward, you can zoom in and take a closer look. So we can zoom all the way in on Venus here and see what it actually looks like through a telescope. Pretty cool. Venus is showing us a little bit more of its day side than its night side right now. However, on the 10th of October, it's a different story entirely for the moon. The moon is over to the east of Venus, which is over to the left as we see it in the sky. You can already see that the moon is a crescent. Let's click on this one, press the space bar to put it in the center, and roll the mouse wheel forward and zoom in and take a closer look. We can see a little bit of the day side of the moon here, but mostly we see the moon's night side. Notice that the night side of the moon is actually not completely dark. The night side of the moon is lit up by light which is bouncing off the earth, and this is called earth shine. A little bit further over into the east, we can see two gas giant planets, Jupiter, which is very bright, and Saturn over to its right hand side, which is not so bright. But these are both also very interesting planets. Let's take a closer look at them, starting with Saturn, the Lord of the Rings. Saturn is well known for its beautiful ring system that makes it many people's favorite planet, and it is indeed absolutely amazing to look at. If you have a telescope, you can see these rings, and if you have a pair of binoculars, you can see Saturn's largest moon, Titan, next to the planet. Let's go and take a look at Jupiter. We'll zoom back out, click on Jupiter, press the space bar to put Jupiter in the middle, and then roll the mouse wheel forward again to zoom in. Jupiter is one of my favorite planets. I love seeing how the storms change, especially the great red spot, which has been raging on Jupiter for hundreds of years. No one knows when it's going to come to an end. If we zoom out a little bit, we can see how Jupiter appears through binoculars. Very small, but we can see its four largest moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, the Galilean moons discovered by the astronomer Galileo Galilei. So we have three planets visible after sunset, Venus, which is setting shortly after the sun, Jupiter, and Saturn. And then we also have the moon. Let's fast forward time a little bit. This is going to make Venus go down below the horizon, but it's going to make the sky nice and dark. And now we're going to move the date forward. And as we move the date forward, pay attention to the moon. The moon is going to change position and it's also going to change its phase. Let's go forward four days. One, two, three, four. Here we are on the 14th of October. And at this point, the moon has changed position and it's moved around in the sky to occupy the same part of the sky as Saturn and Jupiter. That means that the moon, Saturn and Jupiter will make a beautiful triangle in the sky on the 14th of October. Notice now that the moon actually appears to be more than half full. We don't really have a name for a half moon, we call it a quarter moon. And when the moon is more than a quarter, we call that a gibbous moon. So now the moon is well on its way to becoming a full moon in October. But not before it passes by Saturn and Jupiter. And when the moon and the planets meet up in the sky, this is called a conjunction. Conjunctions are really beautiful, quite spectacular actually, and they're very easy to take photographs of as well. So when you pick up You Can Explore the Universe, you can learn how to take your first astrophoto, and I think that planets and the moon are an excellent subject. 
because they're so bright and so easy to find. Let's take a look at some stars. Now it's autumn in the northern hemisphere, but that doesn't mean we can't still see some summer stars. If we take a look right above Jupiter and Saturn, we find a fairly bright star that's labelled in Stellarium called Altair. And above Altair there are two more bright stars, Vega, and this one over here is called Deneb. If I zoom in a little bit more, Deneb will have a label too. Deneb, Vega and Altair make up a trio of stars called the Summer Triangle. And all three of these stars belong to different constellations. Altair belongs to Aquila the Eagle. Vega belongs to Lyra the Lyre, which is a harp. And Deneb belongs to Cygnus the Swan. We can't see any of these constellations because they're just imagined pictures. You have to play join the dots with the stars to find them yourself. But Stellarium can teach you how to look up constellations. Down here at the bottom, you can switch on constellation lines. You can also turn on constellation labels. And finally, if you really want to fill up the picture, you can have the artwork that people imagined when they looked at these constellations in the past. With the artwork on, we can see all sorts of animals and people and other objects of interest in the sky. There are 88 constellations in total, and they range in size greatly. My favourite is one of the smallest, and we can find it here next to the Summer Triangle. Let's turn everything off and zoom back in again. You'll notice that if you come down to Altair, the star at the bottom of the Summer Triangle, and look a little over to the left, there's a tiny diamond here. And this diamond is the body of Delphinus the Dolphin. Let's turn those pictures back on. I like Delphinus the Dolphin because it's part of a great story. A story of a legendary Greek poet called Arion, who travelled the Mediterranean, entertaining kings and queens. And it was said that his voice was very beautiful. One day when he was on a ship coming home with all the riches that he had gathered from all of his concerts, his crew decided to stage a mutiny and throw him overboard. But they offered him one final wish, and he wished to sing a song. And the story says that Arion's song was so beautiful that when he threw himself off the ship, a dolphin caught him and took him back to the shores of Greece, where he lived to an old age. And so it was Zeus, the king of the gods, who immortalized the dolphin in the sky forever. The Summer Triangle is easy to find high up in the south after the sun goes down. But what about on the other side of the sky? What about the north? The north actually has some very surprising and very recognisable patterns in it. One of them at this time of year is found after sunset exactly as we would imagine it in our minds. It's a pattern we sometimes call the plough or the big dipper. And here it is made up of seven stars. Well, that's how it appears, but Mizar here is actually part of a little double star, so there are really eight stars in the plough. Mizar and Alcor's names mean the horse and the rider. The plough is not a constellation, though. Try to imagine that this is a long tail and that this is the back of a large creature. The creature's back legs are stretching down here, its front legs are down here, and its head is up here. You might be able to see in your mind something that looks like a large mammal with a long tail, but you'd be forgiven for not realising what this is supposed to be. This is the great bear, Ursa Major. I'll forgive you for not recognising that, because of course bears don't really have long tails like this. This is due to the story of how the great bear came to be flung into the sky, stretching out her tail in the process. But what we can do over here in the north is we can use the plough to find our way to true north. This star here is called Merak, and this one is called Dupe. And Merak and Dupe are known as the pointers. If you trace a line between Merak and Dupe, and continue that line up into the sky, you will arrive at Polaris, which is known as the Pole Star, or the North Star. Polaris is actually the tip of the tail of the Little Bear. So I like to think of these as the polar bears because they help us to find the star at the pole of the sky. If you were standing at the Earth's North Pole, this star would be right above your head. But we're not at the Earth's North Pole, so this star isn't right overhead, it's over above the northern horizon. What's remarkable about this star is that as the Earth turns in space, all the other stars seem to move around this one, and we can use Stellarium to prove it. Let's click on this star once again 
And now I'm going to speed up time and watch what happens. As the Earth turns, all the constellations seem to revolve anti-clockwise around this star. Constellations are rising in the east over to our right, and they're setting in the west over to our left. Now I'm going to allow the constellations to rise a little bit higher, and we're going to take a look at the sky at around about 20 past midnight. So if you stay up very, very late, you can see some fantastic constellations that are just around the corner because we are approaching a new season and that season is winter. And with winter, we see the rising of Orion. Now Orion is one of the most famous constellations in the sky, made famous for the three stars that make up his belt, Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka. And also famous for the big, bright, red-orange star Betelgeuse, which some people pronounce Betelgeuse, and over here, Rigel, another bright star in Orion. Betelgeuse is the shoulder of Orion, and Rigel is like the shin or the knee of Orion. So we can imagine him standing upright with a shield of some kind and maybe brandishing a sword over his head. Ancient people imagined him as a mighty hunter, and here he is, apparently going into battle with Taurus the Bull. You can actually see inside Taurus the Bull a very sparkly star cluster known as the Pleiades. The Pleiades is sometimes also called the Seven Sisters, but there are actually more than seven stars here. I've counted 14 stars myself with just my eyes, and with very large telescopes, you can see dozens. In fact, astronomers have discovered that there are more than a thousand stars inside this young star cluster. Now, the Pleiades looks like a sort of wintry cluster, and it is indeed something that we see throughout the winter. But ancient people used to associate the Pleiades with Halloween, because that's when it would rise in the year. So at the end of this month, look for the Pleiades and try to imagine those superstitious stories from the past, wherein people believed that the Pleiades were a ghostly door to another dimension. Now let's take another look at Orion. We can see all of these blue things in the sky, and October brings its own, the Orionids. The Orionids meteor shower reaches its peak on the 21st of October. Let's go forward to that date, and see how things will look in the sky. Now here we are on the night of the 21st of October. If we stay up until about 11.30 or so, we can see that the radiant, that's the point in the sky where the Orionids meteors seem to come from, is just rising in the east. So on this night, we expect to see shooting stars flying away from the east and going to all other parts of the sky. The moon will be very bright on this night. In fact, if we zoom in, we can see that the moon is almost full. The full moon in October is called the hunter's moon, and it's going to occur just before the peak of the meteor shower. So it'll be a very dazzling night to go out and see the nearly full moon and also these beautiful shooting stars. The best thing about the shooting stars from the Orionids is that they come from one of the most famous comets of all, a comet you've probably heard of, Halley's Comet. So I recommend going outside on the 21st of October, staying up late and waiting to see tiny pieces of Halley's Comet burn up in starry skies overhead. It's going to be quite a sight. Well, that brings us to the end of our star tour. But that's just the night sky for October. The sky changes with all four seasons. And if you want to learn more about what's visible in each season, then you can take a free stargazing course with me. It's going to take a little bit longer, I'm afraid, another half an hour or so to watch all the videos. But to do that, all you have to do is go to stargazing.london and click on the button that says, I want to go stargazing. You'll be able to take a free tour of the stars with the Stargazing Made Simple Taster course. And you'll be able to learn about more things that you can see in the autumn sky, as well as things that are going to become visible in the winter, then through to the spring and summer as well. So I hope you'll join me there at stargazing.london, and I very much hope you'll enjoy the activities in You Can Explore the Universe. So from me, Tom, I wish you very clear skies. <laughs>